time is day, internet, and welcome to Voices from the Grid, season four, stroke zero, stroke whatever we're calling this season. Uh, we're back. Uh, it's me, uh, Ben Taylor, uh, oh, and I'm partnered up with my partner in SAS, uh, Sasha Kaplan. How you doing? We are the snarky dynamic duo. That is true. Yeah, and and what a set of episodes to put the two of us on. Oh my um, god, really though. Granted, it's an improvement from last time to a certain degree, but it's yeah. Uh, Oi. So today we were reviewing three episodes. Uh, Brother, can you spare an arrowhead? Trust in me, and it came from Angel Grove. Um. So. Let's start with the fact that that we're reviewing the end of a saga that Bet Mike and Brian were reviewing. <laughs> I was going to get to that, right? Okay. Because when we were divvying up the episodes for this season, I was like, I specifically want absolutely nothing to do with the Tommy Arrowhead saga because it's... A, it's more Tommy episodes. Yep. B, it's a weird form of uh, cultural nonsense. Like, all cultural of a sudden, Tommy's Native American. And just fiction. Yeah. All of a sudden, Tommy's Native American and has a brother that he cares about so deeply that... Because he's adopted. They were adopted. Yeah. And then there's a dude that is literally a ghost. But... It is worth reviewing that pile of nonsense to get to the other two episodes in this uh, little trifecta. Um, One of which I have opinions on, the other one of which I really enjoyed. Uh, But we'll get to that. So, brother, can you spare me an arrowhead? Is the conclusion of the four-part arrowhead arc. Which was not a multi-parter for some reason. No, it's something that I quite enjoy when uh, other shows do it, where they don't call it like part one, part two, part three. And it's just like a long-term story. It's much like when we had the, uh, like, Kimberly's exit arc. It wasn't all just a different shade of pink, parts one through ten or whatever. I think I'm just sort of shocked at the lack of multi-parters this season compared to like all of the multi-parters we had previously. Yeah, because season three was all multi-parters, right? Like, yes. But um, we've had two, uh, we've had three episodes before this, which I want to point out, I categorically refused to watch. So if any of my opinions are things that are answered in the other three parts of the arc, I don't care. Okay. Um, Yeah, no, I tried watching it and I I couldn't because the whole arc is like Tommy starts having a nightmare vision Mm -hmm. thing. He goes on a vision quest. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. This is before the actual vision quest. This is like. The arc starts with, like, I only watched the beginning of it, Mm -hmm. whereas, like, Tommy starts having these weird dreams, and they're prophetic, and then he meets the, 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 this Native American gentleman who is the same actor who, um, aided Tommy on a Zeo quest, and then he, like, offers him a ride home because Tommy's a nice dude, and then they just sort of get to, like, a quarry, and the Native, the, the, the guy's like, okay, you can drop me off here, and then he just, like, you know, does the vanishing thing, Yeah, and I'm just like, no, Yep. But what is important is we had a new toy for kids to buy. Yeah, we get the uh the new defender the, wheel. The new defend well no, we had the defender wheel a little before. Because we, we we debuted that when we did our previous recording session together. In this one, we have the new the mega weird wheel thing, right? The new Zord, the, the oh, okay. Zord with the with the shooty arms that combines with the other sword by getting a piggyback. Uh, which we see the combining sequence twice in this episode, just in case we didn't understand how it worked. 
Yeah. But the episode starts with in the middle of a fight. Right. Let's be quite clear about that. We, for someone who hasn't watched the other three episodes, the episode, it comes in and. And there's no like previously on Power Rangers kind yep. of a thing. No. It's just like a fight. Yeah. And I was like. And there's not even I a cold thought... open to yeah. the episode. Like the, the other four Rangers are in the Zeo Megazord and they're off finding, fighting someone called Mace Face, I think. And then that sounds right, but at this point you Tommy, could make something up and it would still sound right because it's Power Rangers. Tommy has given uh the arrowhead to the arrowhead is this mystical thing that had been given to him by some ancient elder, apparently. Uh he, he's given that to Mondo because Mondo cares about it for some reason. Well, the- yeah, they explain that later. But what's interesting in that moment is as he's fighting Mondo, Mondo basically double crosses him. And Tommy says the dumbest line I've ever heard said by a power ranger. He goes, I never should have trusted you. I'm like, in what universe do you ever trust the bad guys? How many times has a ranger been kidnapped and Rita's given an ultimate ultimatum or Zed is given an ultimatum? And it's just like, you should know by now, the bad guy will always double cross you. Like you've been a power ranger for like three seasons before this how do you not know this yeah it's like like are you new here over the last like two seasons tommy has developed this habit of monologuing in case like he did it in a previous two-part where they needed to fill about 30 seconds where he starts going off about, oh my god, this could be the end of the Power Rangers, right? He did that in mm-hmm. season three. And then here, after Mondo disappears, he monologues again and just punches the ground for some reason. Um, but, but like, so the funny thing is, when I thought the episode like cut off, I thought the Rangers had been kidnapped or something. Because there's this line where like I have to choose between the Rangers and my brother or something like that. Yeah, so his brother-brother has been kidnapped. Right. Right. So apparently Tommy is thinking he has to choose between the big fight about about taking the new Zord to join the the Rangers fighting Mace Face or his brother who is in a cave that Tommy literally cannot get into because of some kind of force field. And Tommy is thinking that's a moral choice. Not that, well, I ca- literally can't do anything about one of them. So let's go take care of the other one. And I would like to point out that when he does go and join the Rangers, the fight takes about one minute. He shows up, the Zords combine, they shoot the dude, he's dead. So there was no choice to be made, right? Right. And even Zordon at that point is like, dude, you know, you have to go and help the Rangers. And I'm like, does he actually have to go and help the Rangers? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like this really would ridiculous. Would he not just like versus- die? That would be great. But it's like family versus Rangers. And I'm looking at this. I'm like, wow, we've literally never seen this before. This is a totally brand new plot line that has never, ever been done before. <laughs> Like ever. Yeah. Uh we we get to see after that we get to see what is one of my favorite things in Zio. Uh two of my favorite things, Zio. One, the relationship between Bulk and Skull and uh Rito and Goldar. Because I, I I said it during season three, I love me some Rito Repulsa. Um but we get to hear a siren, which I was like, what's that? And they're yep, like, oh, that that's Angel, Angel Grove's all clear siren. Like an actual warning system to do with the monster attacks, which I was like, that's really, I was wondering if they had something like that, right? Which. I don't know, I quite like We do that. get sort of little hints about the 
we still don't understand the economy of age old growth, but we do get a little bit more information about how the society functions in relation to the Power Rangers, which mm -hmm. is the sirens. And I can't remember what episode it's in. Um, maybe it's in the next. No, it's not in the next one, but there's this whole thing with like, maybe it wasn't even my episode where like Lieutenant Stone is showing bulk and skull. The it's this one. Okay, it's this it is one. this one. And he's okay, putting my them through like is... a Rorschach test. Yeah, and then he's like, at the end, it's like, Oh, well, you guys are obsessed with monsters. And for any other town, this would be a problem. But since this is Angel Grove, the book says that we need you. And I'm like, huh. Yeah, the book that's like, I'm nuts. Uh, you're nuts, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, because that clearly looks like a trusted manual, like the DSM-5 or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oy. Um so going back to uh the arrowhead no going back to, to david being held in the cave there are a bunch of cave paintings in the cave um one of which comes alive yep uh and uh billy and becomes the monster for the episode right called yep. the Autochthon. And Billy said something like, oh, they're like the earliest known form of life on the planet. And he says it in a way like, duh. Like, everyone knows that. And I'm here to point out, no, they're not. That's not science, Billy. Blah, 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 blah. That's not how science works. And then Tanya's like, I thought these things were just a myth. And Zola's like, no, it's just been created by all the evil in the cave. And I'm like, isn't that the same? <sighs> you know, Power like if you look at the world in Power Rangers, first of all, like just in, in 30 years of continuity, all of these bad guys trying to take over the earth, you'd think they'd learn after like the mass invasion, after the other mass invasion, that like you don't mess with the earth. But it fascinates me to no end how many pits of despair and, and you know, the, like evil places there are on earth that bad guys have been like mining or like developing or imbuing with evil over the centuries. That we, with like satellite imagery, don't know about well because magic doesn't show up on satellite imagery duh uh, ben right. yeah okay yeah yeah <laughs> that is how magic works that and the whole that and the whole atmosphere on the moon thing there's yeah. a very simple explanation yeah yeah so this ichthon monster so the the arrowhead apparently has the power to control monsters because as is explained by wise and the old native american elder uh a long ago uh a warrior heavily implying it's something to do with tommy um appeared and trapped all these evil spirits in the arrowhead yep and then and if you put the arrowhead into the little into the big stone it will release all the bad guys yeah and it also has the power to control monsters ah yes thank you so when the autochthon shows up mondo's like well we should teleport that thing to fight the rangers and i'll control it with this arrowhead right and in a move that is probably the smartest thing I've ever seen anyone do in Power Rangers. As the thing's being teleported away, Tommy's brother David just grabs the thing and teleports with it. Yep. It, it, it's a staggering level of brain for this episode. This brain, this episode does not have a lot of brain. Do you know what I mean? It's a pretty stupid episode. 
I mean, to be perfectly honest, this entire arc was kind of stupid be, just for, for the reasons that we've already outlined that it's playing on these, like, I can't even call them Native American stereotypes because yeah. they're just fiction. Um, I don't know, the like, m- m- anyway. And then- but if they wanted to give Tommy an arc, like maybe it would have been interesting if his brother was like, oh my God, we've reunited, come back to, you know, live with me on the reservation, help our community. And maybe Tommy struggles with that and realizes, and then, you know, you can do the thing where David gets kidnapped because Mondo does the thing that Rita does, which is spying on the Rangers at all times of the day, which is incredibly creepy. Um, like you could have done something, I think a little bit more in depth, but I'm just so confused by some of the plot elements we're seeing this season. Could you imagine if this was like a two episode, two two season long arc, and this is what leads to Tommy leaving? Not just, uh, we're passing the powers to other Rangers because... I thought it was because he wanted to be a race car driver. (sighs) But no, you're right. That would have been so much cooler than the whole race car driver thing. But we needed something for him to do in Turbo. So there's oh, yeah. this, you, you brought it up a bit before, but there's this thing that suddenly dropped on the Rangers uh, that if there's this special stone, that if Mondo merges the arrowhead with the stone, well, first of all, David gets out, he's captured by cogs, he's held by one cog, even though he's apparently as good a fighter as Tommy is. And does nothing about it, he's just awkwardly standing there as the cogs hold him. Yeah, and because apparently everyone in the Oliver family is a is, is a martial arts god. Apparently um, it's genetics. Maybe yeah. their great great grandfather and I don't know was like a great, great champion of whatever that sealed people into an arrowhead. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then they get away from there, and Tommy reveals to David that he's the Red Zeo Ranger. Bear in mind, though, that before he does that, David is freaking out. Yeah. He's like, my brother, they probably have my brother. We have to go rescue my brother. And Tommy's like, no, no, your brother's fine. Your brother's fine. He's like, no, you don't understand. Which I thought was a nice bit because there's yes. a point in one of the episodes where David, Tommy, real like David tells Tommy that they're brothers and whatnot. And he's like, now that I found you, I'm never leaving you again. And so it's my, because we don't really know backstory exactly. And Tommy didn't seem to really remember having a brother. It's possible that we know David's older. So maybe it was like, uh, Tommy was just young enough to forget where he came from. But David would have been old enough to remember having a brother and loving his brother. And so I thought that was actually a very nice touch in the episode that he's like so in a nice touch of acting. He's really worried. And this is um, I found out that this is actually Jason David Frank's brother playing his brother character, um, which I thought was very nice because it does give it does give that familial chemistry. Um, So I thought that was a nice touch. And then you have the reveal of like, no, 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 no. Let me explain why. Tommy's fine and then he takes off the helmet and he's like oh you're a power ranger yeah it's and then David isn't stupid and puts two and two together like okay if he's the red ranger then these color coded nitwits called his friends yeah. are also probably power rangers yeah the only thing I didn't like about that is the whole I will never leave you again and then you don't see him for most of the rest of the season he's just that's yeah. the that's the drawback yeah but I guess uh... they do communication don't they mention him in a later episode oh, they keep in the communication in the same way that dear john letters happen um <laughs> all right so never mind we will never see this character again i mean we'll, well see, actually we don't see him again we, we see him very briefly at the beginning of the gold zeo ranger arc because he's one oh of yeah because we need a he's one yeah. of the people that uses the the misdirect for that yeah um <clears throat> going so far as to when the person who does end up becoming the gold zeo ranger is approaching and you don't see their face they are dressed a lot like eric um anyway um but the stone thing happens and in the course of like 30 (laughs) seconds we go from oh no mondo has found the place to put the arrowhead in to i've put the arrowhead in and the power rangers can't stop me 
to I can feel the ancient powers leaving me because the Power Rangers have the arrowhead back in 30 seconds. That must be a new record for the for for, for foiling a plot. Yeah, it, it's he literally puts the stone in arrowhead in the stone. Tommy launches the new Zord, shoots the rock, and while they're all recovering, teleports out of the Zord to the rock, takes the arrowhead and teleports off again. I will give them credit for the fact that Tommy effectively used the Zord as a distraction. Yeah, and artillery. <laughs> yeah, and artillery, but it's I, I, it's kind of a refreshing change of pace because it was always like, oh, don't escalate the fight until the bad guys do. And yeah. here's Tommy like, nope, we're just going to go straight for the Zord. Yeah, I'm just going to drop a Zord on him. Like, just... <laughs> it's more effective than a lot of their other plans. But this points to what you and I, I think this is kind of cementing what we already knew all along as we reviewed our previous episode is the fact that Mondo's a terrible bad guy. Yeah. He's useless. He's incompetent. He, he, he's like, he's not, he could literally, like you said, launch a full scale invasion and sit back and relax, but he's just doing the same shtick Rita and Zed were doing. Yep. I mean, uh, and not even with that much cleverness, like one thing I will say sometimes got creative. One thing I will say for Mondo, uh, that we see a bit more in this episode and in the next episode is he gets in the field a bit more than Rita and Zed did. Like, he actually shows up to fights. Yeah, that's true. Like, he's here putting the arrowhead in himself. And in the next episode, he's part of the plan to aid the distraction. You know what I mean? Anyway, but we'll get to that when we talk about trust in me. Um, so they make the Ichthon grow. The Zeozord has a really bad time with Silly String. Uh, and then the new Zord shows up. They get a piggyback for the second time in this episode. We literally get the battle, the Zeo Battle Zord assembly sequence twice in a 20 something minute episode. Um, and then, I mean, we talked about Bulk and Skull. And then at the end of the episode, uh, David and Tommy are sitting in the juice bar and at some point, they're both holding the arrowhead. And it just decides to split in half. Just mystically, magically. Uh, it's just like, oh, yeah, I should fall apart now. Even though... Well, no, because wasn't that the arrowhead that... They're the part of the arrowhead that the Elder gave to Tommy during the Zeo saga that was then connected to David's half of the arrowhead? Or is that a different arrowhead? You're and we're going to go with like, it's the same like arrowhead until the rest people of this saga. Yeah, I'm going to go with it's the same arrowhead unless people on Twitter start attacking us when this episode airs. Yeah. Um, which means that the arrowhead can be split. And so they decide to split it to, I guess, prevent it from falling into I don't know. From those hands again because he can't combine two parts of an arrowhead, surely. Um, but well, yeah. if, if if one half of the arrowhead is in one place and the other somewhere else, it'll make it harder. I don't know. Yeah. Even though teleport technology exists. Anyway. Um, <laughs> half the time, there have been episodes where, where we're just like, you can teleport. Oh, yeah. Why aren't you doing it? It's like they forgot. All right. So that concludes... Brother, can you spare me an arrowhead? Uh, I apologize to everybody for us sort of um, doing that as a bit of a throwaway. I'm sure that Mike and Brian really got into this in the last episode. Um, but we don't care. But they decided to give the final episode of Tommy's big arc for the season to the two people in the team who hate Tommy. Uh, so we're just going to stick to our guns. Um, Besides, it gives a little bit of a break from the Tommy worship. You know, it's a refreshing yeah. break. So uh, the next episode for well, the next episode of ZO we are reviewing today is Trust in 
me in which mm-hmm. rocky uh the synopsis on uh ranger wiki is rocky takes an interest in a blind karate student but she distrusts him and the others meanwhile king mondo summons the defector to gain the rangers and even alpha five's trust not the most accurate synopsis none um, of that is remotely accurate uh, some of it parts is. of it are some of it is little things um, but so the premise of this episode is uh it's it's based around this blind karate practitioner called um uh penny oh she did have a name okay she did she did um she doesn't get any the person playing her is not credited at all no one could tell you who's playing her she's listed as question mark question mark question mark on the ranger wiki even though she's in like 60 percent of this episode not even on i wonder if she's on the imdb i don't know um weird okay The episode starts with Rocky, Tanya, and Billy showing rocking up to the Angel Grove Community Center and saying, I'm really looking forward to this demonstration. Uh, apparently, she can defend herself against three men at once, <laughs> uh, which Tanya makes some comment about oh, you boys being worried or something. And then they walk into a so- packed... Con- sorry. Before we get to the reveal about her, this part, I thought it was the funniest and dumbest part of this, ep- one, one of the funniest and dumbest parts of this episode, because Tanya is really, she's like, she can take on three guys at once. And I'm like, and you literally fight monsters and, 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 and putties and, 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 and like things that can kill you. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why this is impressive. And then she goes, are you both scared, boys? And I'm like, of what? They literally have two very capable fighters on their team who are girls. Like, it's not like they've never seen a girl fight before. Yeah. Whoop-de-freaking-do. Yeah. It's just, it's so unnecessarily dumb. They're also... And we'll get to this later, but they're the kind of people that are going to be pro women being able to defend themselves right Right? so it's not like this is some unheard of thing that she's dragging these like sexist men to i think it's what it's rocky and billy that go with her i'm just like come on if there's one thing billy knows is that any woman could probably kick his butt and And he's he's probably probably into it exactly (laughs) (laughs) and so this was just like Okay, so they get into the the fight, right? And they conveniently, like, nobody's taking the seats in the front. And I'm like, okay. That's what I was, I literally was about to say. They walk into a packed convention center and get front row seats. No. It's standing room only everywhere else in the youth center. And then there's just these three seats in the front row that they just go and sit in. And I'm like. must have put in, like, a sign at the bottom that says reserved for the noobs that are here every day. And I was like, have they ever been to a convention center in a Those busy convention bars. room? Like, in a panel room? From where was the first seats to go? Anyway. It's Power Rangers. But what's interesting, so the, they, we find out that the, the fighter is blind. But yeah. can I just say, they talked, they talked up how, oh, she can take three guys at once, and she takes three guys one at a time. Yeah. And it's not the same thing. And it's not yeah. to say she's not a capable fighter, even though the choreography was not the greatest. Um, but I was like, I was expecting something a little bit more exciting than what we got. Right. So when I said that we were had an issue at an episode that was going to give us some talking points, uh, this is the one I was talking about. Uh, so after the demonstration, Rocky, Billy, and Tanya go over to Penny and start talking to her. 
and uh, she drops some things and they're like, oh, <laughs> let us help you with that. And she's like, I don't need your help. Right? <laughs> now, as a person who has a disability, right? I want to point out that Penny's being the douchebag here. Because you are, she is assuming that what they are doing is being done because of her disability. Not because they were trying to be nice. It, it comes up even in the previous line. Yeah. Before she drops her bag, right? Where Billy's like, when, where did you learn to fight? And she's like, oh, because I'm blind. And I'm like, why would that be the connection? And Billy's taken aback by that. And Rocky's like, no, it's because like you, you're you want to know where you learn martial arts. Yeah, we just want to learn martial arts. And I, I think like you can tell Billy was like kind of like surprised by that comment because that's yeah. definitely not how he meant it. And Billy being still slightly awkward, he's he he doesn't know how to respond. And so Rocky's like, we're just curious where you learned. And she's like, oh, from my father. And then she gets up and dumps her bag is sort of dumped. And I think. In her defense, I would say that she's probably a person who has had to deal a lot in her life with people who like want to help her, but don't always have the best intentions or know what they're doing. And right. so I'm not it's saying not, that she like, hasn't, right? Right. But there's but, like this, there is like this sort of implied before she says the line, which is very harsh. I agree. There's like this sort of implication of like, they don't really like awkwardness from like mostly Billy and Rocky, which I think just, just cause the fact that she's a pretty girl who can fight rather than the fact that she's blind, but they're not sure how to like navigate that. I don't know. Well, I think to, 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 to go back to this, Yes, she's probably had a lot of people who are trying to look down on her because she has a disability, right? However, that is no excuse for assuming everyone is doing that, right? Yeah. Um, especially when you are on a crusade yourself to be treated like a normal person and like everyone else, you should apply that to others. You should practice what you preach. Valid. Right? Now, I, there are some things I do actually physically need help with, right? Yeah. But if I, I'm walking up to a set of doors, right? that have the little things where I can push them and they'll open automatically for me. And someone wants to open the door, for, hold the door open for me. I'm not going to yell at them. I'm going to be like, thanks. Right? Yeah. Because they took the time out of their day to do something nice. And we know from the previous three seasons, this isn't the Power Rangers looking at at her differently because she's blind well remember we nice. had that episode we had that episode where kimberly's friend who was deaf yeah i can't remember her name but she was like that was a really good episode yeah and you know it gave a lot of attention to the deaf community and it had her be kind of a central point where she like sees i think she like in that episode she like caught saw lord zed on a hike or something and like ran off and then tells the others um and then like has to lead them back or leads Kimberly back to wherever and then they get captured or something but it was a really good episode it was actually surprisingly well written yeah. um so this is like I had flashbacks to that and I guess maybe the difference is she doesn't know these people they're like it's not even though they go to the same like even though they go to the same high school she doesn't know them which i think given how overachieving these children are it would be ridiculous if anybody at the school doesn't know them because they're in charge of every like fundraiser juice club event sports match and and everything except like and like i don't know charity galas 
they, they do everything in the yeah. school because, you know, so it'd be kind of silly if she doesn't know them, even though they don't know her. And I was like, oh, so maybe this is somebody who's like, you know, travels around the country and gives demonstrations and talks about her experiences. And then we see her at the school the, literally in the next scene. Yeah. And they're at the school mm -hmm. and they're watching her give the demonstration to the to the younger kids all of which look to be way below high school age by the way um yeah i don't know maybe it was like a visiting middle schooler situation maybe <laughs> and Rocky or maybe there's something. a daycare center at the school because the, the 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 way that the, the the city functions never makes any sense yeah. we're just gonna go with that maybe it's a case of 12. yeah and then Rocky says something about, I wonder why she's so aggressive. And Kat turns around and makes the comment. Um, she seems to imply that Rocky and the others feel sorry for Penny when that's literally never been shown on the screen. All they've tried to do is be nice to her because yep. they are nice. Yep. That would, if they had shown at any point Billy, Rocky, or Tanya thinking less of this woman because she is blind. And her then You don't even realize she's blind until like after the fight. Or there's a line, I think, somewhere after the fight or something yeah. that tells us that. But well, yeah. No, no. You see her picking up the, the cane and unfolding the cane, and they go, That's right. She's blind. Um, if there had been any form of her dealing with discrimination in this episode at all. Not even Bulk and Skull, not random passers by, not Lieutenant Stone. No one discriminates against this woman in any way. No one even like, no one makes a comment towards her. No one tries to infantilize her. Like, yeah. The closest thing you get is when the young kid is like, how do you do stuff? Yeah. And that's a fine comment for a young kid because they, they don't, don't know. know. <laughs> and she responds appropriately and shows him, then talks to him and like in a way that is like not jerk to children. Yeah. And she's like, she, she's like, you got to trust your other senses. Like, do you have peanut butter and jelly for lunch? Because I can smell it on your breath and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. No one at any point is even vaguely discriminatory or thinks less of this woman or goes out of their way to force their help upon her outside of the rangers going, hey, let us help pick up your stuff. Yeah. Because we're nice. Not because we're discriminating against you. We want to be your friend, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess maybe it can be argued they tried to do like something different with her in like the sense that like they didn't like they wanted to give her like, a, I don't know, something different to her character. Um, but I don't know. It was kind of weird. But anyway, moving on from like the, the, the this part of it. Um, I, I, I put in here that Rocky has no girl skills. Rocky has no skills in a lot of things. Well, we're taking it one episode at a time. Um, I did want to make a joke here about how in the last season we covered um, Rocky learning chemistry. But he seems <laughs> to have forgotten that. Um, yeah. Yeah, R Rocky... Uh, insert joke about doors and not being good at them um i don't know it's just i i don't what is there to say other than this might be the most awkward i've ever seen rocky be oh gosh that's saying a lot there's been quite a few episodes and then there's the subplot of Bulk and Skull being undercover. Which was fantastic. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, pointing out once again that Penny smells Bulk and Skull 
from like 10 meters away and just bear in mind that so far she's detected the breath of a small child having had pb and j and smelt bulk and skull from like 10 meters away this will come in important later yep i see where you're going with this already uh rocky ha- uh she she meets up with rocky in the park um they start talking he treats her exactly as he did before and then she's suddenly like oh do you want to walk me to the bus stop and yep. while they're on their way they get uh we, there's we like a weird them. buzzing that she hears and then rocky's communicator goes off yeah and then because mondo's created this monster and there's this plan to have the monster gain the trust of the rangers and lure them into a trap. Yeah, also, I found it funny that his monster's actual name is Defector. Yeah, because he's played from parts of old robots, <laughs> and he's pretending to defect. Right? Yep. But there's like a switch or something that, um, what's his name, our randomly Scottish cog uses yeah. um, to, I guess, make him good versus bad, because there's that moment where he just like rescues a puppy. Yeah, yeah. Um, brief interruption there. Go ahead. Sorry, Sasha. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, I don't know. Like the, it gave me some like precursors to Wasp with a heart a little bit at the beginning, where he's like, "Oh, he rescues a puppy and he cares." And then, of course, like our Scottish co- in in the quarry when he's the they're they're staging the whole thing there's the moment where like our our scottish cog has a name i'm sorry what is his name clank sure the scottish cog uh no clank has this like device and he pulls the switch and it like rechanges him back to bad or something yeah that was interesting but you know rocky's communicator goes off right and he's like, ah, sit right here. I'm going to go find the source of the noise. And he steps like maybe three feet away from her. Around the corner. Right? And 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 turns on his communicator and he's like, go ahead, Zordon. And then he morphs. And I'm like, she just didn't notice any of that. He even whispers it's morphing time, which I thought was sure. quite funny. Um, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll believe that. We'll buy that. Yeah, I don't know. Um... Uh, I can have uh, I, I, like the distance thing. Yeah, I did notice. Like, if she might be able to hear that, but that's not really what I was driving towards with the with the smell stuff. We'll we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I quite like the and as I said before, when we reviewed Puppet Blaster, right. The concept for this episode is a really interesting one that would have been much more interesting if it had played out over time. Yeah. Like if they'd introduced the defector early, not shown that he was part of King Mondo's plan, right? Yeah. And then have him turn on the Rangers like 15 to 20 episodes later, then that would have been like a dagger in the back kind of thing right rather than just like have this weird feeling where the rangers come to trust this dude in this course of like 20 minutes well and then like know, rescuing they, a puppy is a then, big deal and then when they're fighting in the 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 quarry they're acting like he'd been their best friend for a year yeah and then when rocky's using the defender wheel to defeat him he's talking like rocky went to bat for this thing even though yeah there's like i can't believe i trust him i'm like when when did you do that what did you do yeah it's weird but then again that's why we get wasp with a heart which is a beautiful episode and there's a line in this bit where they're trying to decide if they should trust Defector, where Cat says that robot must know that 
King as King of Mondo's plans and could give us the advantage we need. And I was just thinking, you're winning. You don't need like what. What you don't need an advantage, you are winning. Yeah, it's not like Mondo has some great evil scheme that this is all leading to because he's stolen different part of you know different things on earth to build a big weapon that he's gonna blast the world with. It's literally none of that. He's just there. Yeah, it's it's bizarre. And then after they meet defect for the first time, Rocky's talking to the other rangers while they're morphed. And Penny picks out his voice Mm -hmm. from like 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. It's like, Rocky, is that you? And he's like, "Uh, yeah, I'm here with the Power Rangers. Rangers. (laughs) And she's like, oh, if you're looking for the big thing, it went that way. And they're like, you daredevil or or what? Like Matt Murdock showed up. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and then the episode Tanya, plays... She hears Tanya's voice very clearly, though. Yeah. And then... Not only does she hear Tanya's voice very clearly, uh, the episode then plays out mm-hmm. exactly as you would expect. The Rangers grow to trust the thing. They flip the switch. They get offended. Mm-hmm. They kill the monster. And then at the end, Penny sat in the... The... the uh, the youth center. Rocky's there talking to her, and the rest of the Rangers show up and start yep. talking around her. Yep. And she doesn't recognize one of their voices. Yep. This being right after uh Lieutenant Stone has been hitting on Bulk and Skull, who are undercover as uh women. But look, they I gotta like I love I loved it for the sheer hilarity of the fact that we start off with Lieutenant Stone, Lieutenant Stone's entire stick in the episode is trying to find Bulk and Skull. Yeah. Um, and Bulk and Skull, like we have to pass our undercover bat, our undercover like merit badge basically. But first they're in a hot dog cart and mm-hmm. Bulk is a hot dog vendor and Skull is apparently a contortionist. He's in the cart and like his legs are all bent up and yeah. He's in the cart, freaking contortionist. <laughs> Um, and then they're like statues in the park. And even the little girl was like, excuse me, have you seen my puppy? And Lieutenant Stone stood like right there. <laughs> yeah, well, he at that point, he'd walked away further, but it was funny he didn't hear that. And now they're very obviously bulk. It's like, like, look, there's a reason why Lieutenant Stone is not actually a cop. He's just like, he was the, tr- he was the like, what is it? The like police academy person. But he's a lieutenant, which means at some point that man has got promoted. Nepotism. Yeah, probably. Bribery. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes off to run a juice bar. Um, no, then, well, no, first he becomes a private investigator, then he goes on to run a juice bar. Right. Right. You're right. Um, juice bar is until next season. Uh, yep. I have a mixed opinion on this episode. Um, it's one of those episodes where Power Rangers is trying to do the moral thing, right? They just don't do it very well in this episode. Yeah. Unlike the episode with Kimberly's Deaf Friend, it's just not executed well here. Um, well, I think part of the problem is that she's not... Like, her purpose in this plot is sort of to just be a love interest for Rocky for two seconds. Who is blind. Who, who Yeah, who is blind. Yeah. Um, but they don't really do anything with her character beyond being just exposition for the blind community, which is great, but we don't really learn anything else about her. What would have been really interesting, like, the whole arc she goes on, right, would have been perfectly okay for me if right before she talks to Rocky, Tanya, and Billy, there are people being douchebags to her because she's blind. Right? Yeah. But because we never, ever see anyone be a douchebag to her 
for being blind, she comes across as kind of the dick bit. And then it's just like she flips the switch because Rocky had a conversation with her for two seconds. Yeah, which he was trying to do before. She wouldn't let him. Right. So, like, what changed between then and now? The adrenaline wore off from the from her fight. I don't know. Anyway, uh, now we move on to what may be my favorite Zio episode. It came from Angel Grove. This episode was such a delight. Yeah. It is absolute proof that the Zordon era, with the exception of In Space, maybe, is at its best when it is not taking itself seriously. Yeah. All of the best episodes of seasons are when they are not taking themselves too seriously, in my opinion, anyway, because I... As I've documented, the one that always gets thrown around is the pizza episode in Turbo, and I love that episode. Um, so the premise of this episode is uh, Adam and Tanya are studying late at night at the high school, uh, which implies the high schools are open at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And they're um, never locked. And they're never, ever locked. And they are being patrolled by policemen. Um, and Adam falls asleep <laughs> while studying and has a dream while watching a monster movie and has a dream which involves a bunch of classic monsters and yep. the Rangers being those monsters. And... Yep. Um, all in all, it's a really dumb, fun episode with the exception of one thing, which we will get to. Okay, well. Uh, but it is an Adam Cedric episode, which is brilliant. I love. Honestly, it's been a little, like, given the episodes that I've already recorded, it is refreshing to see Adam do th- something. It is. We are in Zeo. Adam has been a thing for two seasons at this point, basically. Half of season two, all of season three, and half of se- season of the Zio season. And yep. this is my first Adam-centric episode. But, like, as I'm going through these episodes, like, Rocky's getting some attention, sort of. We had some episodes with Tanya because we kind of had to build her up as a character a little bit. Um, she isn't just Aisha. Yeah, exactly. But then, like, like the only other thing I remember seeing Adam do was when he was, like, helping Tanya with her karate skills. Yeah. Yeah. I've missed Adam, and I didn't even know I was missing him. Yep. So. (sighs) Adam falls asleep. Yep. And which we don't know by the way. Oh, we we know. All right. We know. All right. It is not, we know he's fallen asleep, but it is not shown that he's fallen asleep, right? You just see like, no, 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 it's not. Well, it's shown at the end, but like at this point. So as I was watching this episode, there's a moment where, so he puts the movie on. Yeah. And he puts his head down and 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 he actually sees his eyes closing. And then we go back to the clock. Okay. And then um, as he's like, wa- then there's like a black cat and he walks into the hallway. And, and then the Rita lady. and Zed. Yep. It is nice to see some semi-competent villains in Zeo. He were there being semi-competent. Yep. Um, it's just nice to see Rita and Zed again. Like, I, I did the Machine and Pyro just awful. Yeah. It was really bad. Yeah. Um, and then the cat's there, and I instantly it's a cute kitty. I instantly thought that that's what they might be doing with Cat's character. Yeah, <laughs> not of, subtle, is it? Because of how she's introduced in the the yep. the, the 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 Pink Ranger stuff. Yep. Um, but then like she was white in that. She was a white cat in that. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then <laughs> the Riga and Zed lay out this plan about this powerful sorcerer um, and how Adam has to get these various items to take to the sorcerer to break the spell. Yep. And the very first person, and I'm going to let you just go on this, the very first person he comes across is Tom Acula. Uh, oh my god, that was so cringy, I can't. First of all, all due respect to Jason David Frank, but please don't do accents. Just, just for the safety of humanity, do not do accents. I don't, like... Okay, it was very odd. I will give them credit because it looks like the entire cast is having so much fun in this episode. Yeah. Right, like, they were like, okay, so we're going to do this episode and there's going to be no morphing and no Power Ranger shenanigans except for Reed and Zed and then, like, you know, King Mondo. And they're like, what? So they lay out this episode and everybody's like, oh, man, I can't wait. And you can tell that Jason David Frank is just having fun with this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um. So basically... Um, Adam has to like get various items from various characters and then eventually present them to the wizard to help defeat King Mondo. And the first thing he needs is a vampire's cloak. <laughs> and so there's this like moment where he's like, Tommy, and he's like, no, I am Tim Macula. <laughs> I can't take that seriously. But then there's like, there's like a moment where he like fights somebody and then he needs to get the cloak and so he's just like look garlic and then he takes the cloak and runs away he grabs it and runs yeah <laughs> um but first was... he's like look lord mondo and so he's like i'm not falling for that one and then he's like garlic he's like ah <laughs> yep um it was just fun and what's really impressive is the entire episode after um adam walks out of the school quote unquote is in black and white because they make a joke. Yeah. Adam's like, why is everything in black and white now? <laughs> Did someone turn the collar off? Pretty much. And it really helps the tone of the episode. Yeah. So then um, after Tommy, we meet Rocky, who is like, totes, not a werewolf, guys. Like, totally not the werewolf. Um, Which is really funny. And then he hears... And Tommy... And Rocky playing an English lord. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, oh my god! I really like the costumes; they were great. Yeah. Um. So then he hears that he's told about this professor guy by Totes, not Lieutenant Stone, and he's like, "Oh, that must be Billy." And so he goes, and it's not Billy. We get to our mummy episode, which is Balkan Skull. Yes, I loved that reveal. I loved that. Just again, the actors do have talent and abilities that I wish could have been explored further with good writing because their acting skills do really like shine in this episode. Right? Like Skull being this perf archaeologist dude, right? And Bulk being the mummy was really funny. And then, of course, they're like, oh, wait, this isn't the professor. You have to go to the real professor, the doctor. Right. And so we go, I'm like, oh, this is Billy. This is Frankenstein. And Alpha as Igor. Oh, is Igor. And it's a pun because he lifts up a patch and he's got like four eyes that's pasted <laughs> to his. And he's got, and Richard Horvitz has the Alpha voice, but he gives it the little bit of, oh, yes, master. <laughs> it was just, it was so, it was so funny. And not going to lie, though, David Yost is a little, looks a little done here, which, like, totally understandable. Yeah. But he's like, but it sort of makes sense because Dr. Frankenstein also is kind of a cold character. If we go by Mary Shelley and not Mel Brooks. I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, it was uh, um, uh, Professor Hackensack, I believe yes, his name I, is. Yes. Because the Hackensack. movie's called The Bride of Hackensack or something. Yeah. And then Tanya is revealed to be um, Frankenstein's monster. Um, In the best overacting ever. Yeah. She's just screaming. Yep. But the facial expressions. Yeah. Are, it's gold. It is yeah. beautiful. 
Did you mention, by the way, that in the the, the mummy mm. part, um, they revealed that the mummy was called Balkan Hotep? Oh, I, I forgot about that. Yes, that is very important, and I yeah. apologize. Yeah, I love that name. It's a good name. It's yeah. Just, it's, so funny like this episode is just sort of like the levity and silliness we needed in a so far rather eh season yeah uh one thing i did quite like which i'm sure was absolutely unintentional absolutely un- I, I am convinced there is no way this was planned some of the angles that are being used when they're looking down on Dr. Von Hackensack animating the bride are very similar to the angles used when Tommy is being turned into the White Ranger. You're right. And I'm convinced it's not intentional. There's no way it was intentional. (sighs) Um, But that is an interesting touch. Um, Yeah. And then finally, so Adam finally gets all of his things together and he goes to see the wizard, which is obviously Zordon. Before we get there, right? Every other ranger has had like this, a long elaborate scene. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And then Kat shows up dressed as a witch, gets her necklace stolen and is done in like 20 seconds. And then she melts. Yep. And then she melts. Well, because, you know, you got to get to the wizard. Time's running out. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, but they really did cat dirty. I she really was, wanted to see. Fine. She led him around the entire situation. She had a character, but as a cat. Yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to see more of her overacting as the witch. Yeah, that's fair. Because I think while we have been very. <clears throat> What is the phrase? Uh, this is derog- derogatory about Miss Hillard's acting. I think she would do a brilliant job of overacting as the witch. I agree. And I wanted to see more of that. I wanted to see her throwing spells and talking about eye of newt and tongue of dog. And- I'll get you, my pretty. Yeah, I want to see a lot. Of, I wanted to see that. Fair. Very fair. But we didn't get that. We just got, oh, I'm going to steal her necklace and get out of here. Yeah, Which pretty much. It made it, it was quite funny that she turned in from a cat and got a, a coin stole from, stolen from her rather than her stealing the coin. Um, and then we get he's in front of uh, the wizard. The wizard, a.k.a. Zordonicus. A.k.a. a jerk in any universe. Yes. And he is told that he has to pick one of his friends to fight Drillmaster in an absolutely shoehorned piece of Sentai footage. Yep. I genuinely thought we might go a whole episode without Sentai footage, but screw me, I guess. Um, And this is the part I hate. When asked who to pick, Adam says to himself, what would Tommy do? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. Wh- I guess that line was in there for th- just so that Zordon or Mondo or whatever could like, oh, you said Tommy's name. Okay, Tommy's going. So we can but use the Red Ranger that- footage. Yeah. Right. But it's you're right. It's weird that Adam would say that one. Adam has had to make difficult choices as a ranger. He's not a noob. He's also better at it than Tommy. That is that is fact. <laughs> We're sorry, guys. This is now officially the Adam Park show. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> and it will be until overdrive. Um, and they just really force the Sentai footage in there. And then there's the reveal that the the Zordonicus is actually Mondo, and Adam's been helping him take over the earth. And everyone seems doomed. And then he wakes up. Yep. Having slept at a high school overnight, his parents not losing their 
gosh darn minds when he doesn't come home. Not calling the police. Not a single teacher has spotted him when they came to open the school. I'm in the sorry. Morning. What are parents? Yeah. What's a what's a like like? There's only been like one, there was one episode that I was watching that is in between these the, these ones and previous ones, and like Mr. Kaplan shows up, and I'm like, oh, Mr. Kaplan, he's still alive. I remember him. <laughs> I remember him. It's How's been a the hot toupee? Minute. Oh my god, that toupee is just it's laughable. But anyway. Um, this episode is simultaneously like a typical it happened in a dream situation with yeah. some really heavy Wizard of Oz vibes and it really works. Yeah, I, I love this episode. Uh, I, I, I'm I critical about the Tommy thing, but it is just there so they could shoe in, shoe horn in the Sentai footage. It is there. there I, I make fun of the fact that the high school is open o- overnight and no one spots Adam there, but I don't care because it's just a nice, fun episode. Um, there is a cute bit at the beginning of the episode that we didn't talk about, which oh, is yeah. um, when, t- so basically Tanya is studying with Adam and Tanya's like, I'm sorry, Adam, I'm done. Yes. And then she gets up and Bulk and Skull are there and they're like falling asleep. And he's like, wait, they're like, wait, 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 you're leaving? And she's like, yeah, I'm tired. I'm going to go home. It's like, but but it's dark out and it's it, a it full is the full moon. moon. And she's like, do you, I'll walk you home, guys. And Skull's <laughs> like, oh, thank you. Puts his head on her shoulder. <laughs> Like they're making out like they're trying to protect her, and she's just like, Don't worry, boys, I'll walk you home. And he's like, Oh, thank you so much. So cute. I really like that. Yeah. But it's another inconsistency in Bulk and Skull. Yeah. Well, there's because been a lot of those this season. To this point, the Rangers have been. Like we had the conclusion of 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 Mighty Morphin and the Alien Rangers, where and we discussed this when we were doing Puppet Blaster, I think. Whatever episodes we recorded previously, yes. That there was like a regression in the relationship between the Rangers and Bulk and Skull. Yeah. And now they seem to be back to being friends. It's it seems like there's a lot of back and forth. And it's sort of like Balkan Skull or whatever the plot needs to be for that episode for the sake of the Rangers. But there is an episode later that Mike and I are doing together where Kat and Tanya actually help Balkan Skull. Yeah. So I don't know what changed or didn't change. I don't know. Maybe the Ranger, maybe Balkan Skull are like, oh, Tommy's girlfriend broke up with them. Maybe you should be nice to the Rangers again. Because Kimberly was our friend, but that was still a jerk move to send him a Dear John letter. Right, but I don't think it's happened at this point, is it? Hasn't it? Aren't we? Isn't this after, or is this before? This is guys. This is the problem with recording episodes out of order. No, this is after no business, like snow business. Right, right, yeah. Is it? Yeah, it is. <sighs> okay, but the stuff before hadn't bit wasn't yes that part's not which is why i'm saying that the transition of like that the transition happens somewhere between poppet blaster and where we are now okay i don't know it just it bothers me that they can't keep their relationship consistent but also like bulk and skull aren't really consistent at all this season that's my point is yeah is as characters bulk like bulk of skulls. I don't think it's too critical to say I think that bulk of skull feel a little bit like afterthoughts this season. Yeah. They're just kind of added in because they either need to pad seat pad episodes or they're like, oh, we need a joke here and it wouldn't fit for the Rangers to do it. You know? Yeah. That's fair. It's, I don't know, like them quitting the, you know, them quitting the police force. We'll get to that when we get to it. Um, Yeah. But uh, I think we need, if there's one thing our listeners have come to expect from, at the very least, you and I, is a focus to be put on Bulk and Skull. Because as we've gone on record as saying they're the most interesting characters in the entire show, at least 
until the end of the Zordon era. Um, and even then, a little bit beyond that. I'm looking at you, Lost Galaxy. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of our episode for today. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, and please go watch It Came From Please uh, go Angel and watch Grove. It Came From Angel Grove. It's such a good episode. Uh, you can kind of ignore the other two episodes, honestly. Um, yeah. That being said, Sasha, See? Uh, where can people find you on this tangled web of the internet? Crying in a corner. No, just kidding. Um, that's just only about my thesis. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Geeky Kaplan. That is Kaplan with a K after the greatest superhero in the Marvel Universe, Billy Kaplan. And over on Tumblr, I am the only VFTG person you can actually have a conversation with on Tumblr. And that is geekgirl101.tumblr.com. I am literally always there for better or worse. Uh, ben, what about you? Uh, you can find me on the Twitter machines at Bob T. Goldfish. Uh, uh, you can find me doing video game streams over at twitch.tv on, uh, slash 321 underscore TV. And you can find me on um, the Voice from the Grid sister show, Awesome Mania, uh, where Mike and I uh, sit down once a month with a friend of ours. We watch through a wrestling pay-per-view from currently, as of the time of recording, uh, the year 1997. And uh, we riff along with it, and it's designed to be like watched along with the pay-per-view, kind of like a, a riff tracks kind of thing. Uh, and don't forget that you can find out more about Voices from the Grid itself over on Twitter at twitter.com slash VFTG underscore PR. That Tweet means. at us. Tell us your thoughts on the episodes. We'd like to ignore you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, of the, the four of us, Sasha and I are probably the most active on the Twitter. Um, Am I really on there? Compared to the other two, yes. Oh, geez. All right. I gotta step um, up my game then. Uh, so, that being said, let's wrap up this episode and we will say, in the words of the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, be excellent to each other. And party on your non gender specific honorifics. And may the power protect you. Peace.